Hello and welcome to Orca in the Stars. My name is Nicole Warrington and I'm an artist on Vancouver Island. I'm so excited to be bringing this lesson to you today. First of all, I want to acknowledge how grateful I am to live and play and work on the traditional and unceded territories of the Comox First Nations. The land that I'm on is Vancouver Island and the ocean that's behind me is the Salish Sea. It thought that I thought that it would be the perfect place to film out an intro because this land is what my um, artwork is all about. If you watched my taster session or um, my, my first bonus lesson, which was um, Field Notes on Feelings, you'll know that my work is really influenced by these lived experiences in this amazing place. I grew up in the coast, on the coast in Vancouver which is just kind of over there behind me and now I've been calling um, this place my home for over 10 years. I grew up in a family that did lots of sailing and exploring on the coast and one of the animals on the coast that is really special to me is the orca whale. In fact, when I was a little girl, I really thought that I was going to go into marine biology studies because I was so enamored with whales. I think they're a really um, beautiful and special animal. Um, I've seen orcas, uh, humpback whales, um, and many other marine species here. In fact, I saw orcas hunting just at this point a couple of years ago. That's a bald eagle just above me. There's a nest right up there. Um, and every time I see whales, even though I've seen them many times before, it feels really magical to me. I think that orca whales are an amazing species. Um, they are, represent strength um, as well as they're, they're beautiful and graceful, um, amazing creatures. Um, for those of you who don't know much about orca whales, they are a matriarchal society, which I find really fascinating and they have really strong social structure and tight family bonds. The orcas here on the west coast, um, there are tra transient orcas as well as resident orcas and our resident orca pod is down to about uh, 70. It's actually several pods that make up the, the residents but there's only about 70 um, orcas left and so they are on the endangered species list. Um, some of the reasons why they are threatened at this time is um, increased uh, noise pollu pollution from ship traveling um, through this area as well as um, a lack of food and resources. Um, the, the salmon have have not returned as much as they have in past years. Um, and so the, the orcas that are the residents are really struggling to, to stay alive. Um, mothers are struggling to give birth to babies that successfully grow up into adulthood. And so um, they're a beautiful animal for me to see, but they also, the ones that are still here to me represent some of the themes that we're discussing this month. We are honoring courage, healing, and strength. And I think the orca really fits into that nicely, especially the orcas that live here in, in what I call my backyard. Um, they are resilient creature and they represent things to me like um, following your inner wisdom um, and keeping together as a family and looking inside for guidance. Uh, in this lesson you'll see a representation of the ocean as well as a single orca, although you could do several if you want them to represent family, and um, uh, ocean stars, the, the sea stars. And to me the sea stars in this lesson are representative of um, following your own guidance and remembering to follow your path kind of like the constellations in the sky these this is the pathway under the water and so that's what the stars represent to me I really hope you enjoy the lesson I'll start off sharing um, my supplies feel free to substitute supplies you don't need a lot of things for this lesson and um, I look forward to sharing it with you I have someone else who has a lot to say in this video. The 
paper that I'm working on today is made by Stonehenge. It's a aqua cold press, 100% cotton paper. I just started using this this past year and I really like it. Um, I like using 100% cotton paper because you can add lots of paint and lots of water to the page, which makes for beautiful wet into wet techniques. Um, this one is a nine by 12 and it's a block. So while I'm painting on it, it's attached. Um, if you have loose paper, that's okay too. You could always tape it down at the corners to make sure it doesn't buckle, um, but a block can be a nice option. If you don't have a higher end paper like this, you could work on something like a Canson. I use this a lot in the studio as well. In fact, I used it in my, um, my first life, life book lesson. Um, the thing about a paper like this though is that it's not 100% cotton. And so when you are uh, layering in on the page with lots of water, uh, you can still get some really pretty effects, but you might, um, we're filling in this big circle, you might get some back runs in it. Um, so just know that it's going to have a different look. I feel like there's a bit more flexibility with a paper like this. Um, you will also need the template of the whale if you choose to trace it. Otherwise you can freehand draw the whale. So this is the template you can print out. I'm going to use a little sketchbook, any kind of paper to practice doing some of the starfish before we draw those. For a tracer for a circle, you can again freehand it. Um, I'm just using a lid that I found in the kitchen. Um, this one's six inches, which I'll just show you here, uh, is approximately the size that I want the circle. And I base that size so that the orca that's going to go on the circle fits. Um, coming kind of across the top of the six inches. So um, you can use a lid or measure it just with freehand it. In terms of drawing supplies, you're going to need um, a pencil. This is just an H pencil. The way that I use um, my template is that I draw on the back side with a softer pencil instead of using um, a, a transfer paper. So I'm just using a soft 4B pencil. For cutting, you can have a choice of scissors or an X-Acto knife. I also have um, got these little tiny sewing scissors that might get into the tiny corners of cutting. A nice white eraser or a kneaded eraser. Some washi tape, any color you like. For drawing supplies, uh, you'll need some sort of white pen that has a fine tip. So I have a couple of choices here. The Uniball Signo is one of my favorites right now. Um, a jelly roll pen in white or a Posca a paint pen. This one has a fine tip, it's the metal tip. So something like that, one of your favorite whites. And I'm not sure exactly which ones I'll use at the end of the painting, but I think uh, I might add some metallic or some color with a paint pen. So jelly rolls or any kind of uh, your favorite drawing implements. During the painting stage, I'm going to use watercolor pencil crayons. Um, I'm going to be working with sort of something in the bluey greens, maybe some browns for seaweed type colors. If you don't have watercolor pencil crayons, that's okay. You can just use watercolor paint or I don't think I'm using these today, but you could try a Neo Color. Um, these are the Car and Dash water soluble pastels. Those would also work, although they don't have quite as fine a tip as the um, pencil crayons. So the scale might be a little bit too large. Let's move these to the side. For painting, you're going to need a selection of brushes. I use synthetic brushes by a local company called Opus Art Supplies, and I have some that are round brushes, flat brushes, uh, one that comes to a nice fine tip. A few of these brushes are a little bit coarser, so they get some nice texture to them when I, I draw the brush around the circle. So a few different choices there. A water jar, of course. I also use a water spritzer often to wet down my paints. A nice cotton rag to go with the paints. And then I'm using a few different paint sets today. So this is my main palette um, and I have it filled with Daniel Smith and Opus Art Supplies paint. Uh, here's a few of my favorite colors that I think I'll be working with. Uh, burnt Sienna I often use in mixing with my greens and blues ultramarine blue, amazonite genuine, cerulean blue chromium, and indigo. Now this is the main palette that I use, but I am finding it a bit small for some of my um, paintings lately. I have more colors that I'm adding. So I, I often, um, as I add new colors to my set, I'll put them into a little tray like this, or I'll put some into the lid, like 
um, the cerulean doesn't have a place here and it should so I possibly need to buy a bigger palette as I buy more colors um, additionally, I don't often work with black in my paintings, so this is a little set that has black in it that I'm going to use for the orca whale. This is um, a really inexpensive set um, made by Yarka. It's a Russian company, and these are uh, semi-moist watercolors, so I'm going to use that one. Uh, at the painting stage, we'll also be using a salt technique, so this is just table salt that I've put into a little dish. And then for the gluing stage, I am going to use uh, the Golden Heavy Gel Matte Medium. It's quite a thick paste. I like it for gluing because it doesn't ooze out everywhere, but you could also use a glue stick or any kind of thicker gluing um, medium that you like. Just not something runny because you don't want it to squish out the edges. And I think that's all that we need. So let's get painting. The first thing we need to do is get out our paper. I'm using the Stonehenge block, so I'm just going to fold the cover over and keep it nice and flat. And I'm using the tracer to center a circle. So it's approximately six inches round, and I'm just going to eyeball it to center it. But of course, you're welcome to use a ruler if you want it to be perfectly centered. And I'm tracing it very lightly with an H pencil. You don't want to press too hard because it will etch lines into your page. And if you etch the lines in, then the paint gets stuck in the little troughs. And although you on the video can barely see my circle, um, I like to make it as light as possible. So I erase it uh, with a white eraser before I begin painting. And now becomes the exciting part. So to get ready for painting, I use a little uh, spray bottle to wet down all my paints. I just got a little spray bottle at the dollar store and I have an extra palette that has a few more colors like indigo that I'd like to use. And before I begin, because I wanna be ready to go with my layers of wet into wet paint, I like to pre-mix a few puddles. I'll be mixing as I go along, but I find that pre-mixing just gives me the freedom to flow in the painting. At this stage of painting is really a meditative part and I want it to flow nicely. So here I'm mixing an ultramarine blue with a little bit of cadmium red, which is like an orange and down in the bottom corner is a burnt sienna. So I often start with one puddle and then to the corners of the puddle of paint, I'll add a little bit of variation to that color. So within one puddle, I might have two or three variations. Now I'm mixing up some uh, cerulean blue, which I think is a nice kind of sky color. And then another favorite these days is Amazonite, which is made by Daniel Smith. It's a beautiful green color. You can push it to a darker green by adding burnt sienna or some orange, um, or you can add blue to it to, to make it a beautiful oceany color. If you don't have something like an Amazonite, you could use a Windsor green or a thalo green. Now this is the scary part, putting down the first brush brush strokes so I just kind of force myself to go for it. This is a light stroke of the cerulean blue and I'm using a large round brush just to lay in some color at the top of the circle. Now you can't see the pencil line but I overlap it slightly. It's just there for a loose guide. This is not going to be a perfect circle. So the first little wash of blue and then I dro start dropping in a bit more color. As I build up this um, circle, you'll notice that I'm going to have the darker colors at the bottom because I'm thinking of underwater and the bottom is where I'll put the starfish eventually. So the bottom is sort of like the ocean floor. I'll go for richer, darker colors like ultramarine, Payne's gray. You could also mix up a phthalo blue with some orange or brown in it to make it darker. This is one of my cheaper brushes, but I like it because it's kind of scrubby. So I use um, a more bristly brush to get texture and then a softer round brush like this one to drop in big juicy globs of paint or to soften things. It's hard to be brave putting in color at first, but I find once I build the first layer, I can start to drop in some darker colors. And this beautiful cotton paper that's 100% cotton really allows me to let these colors flow into each other. So it stays wet for a while and I can keep stretching it. Uh, I can add more color, I can blend the colors into each other, and I can just keep dropping in more colors and lines. So here I come in with a wiggly line of some of that Amazonite green. 
and I kind of drag it through the other colors and out through the top. I'm thinking about this motion of waves or even seaweed and I'm just thinking about flow. Here I'm coming in with a bit more of that green mixed in with some brown. And I know that I want to leave some light area in the center of the circle, so I'm thinking about how far in I want to bring that color to the center, and I'm building up the bottom. So keeping your puddles nice and juicy, you want to keep them wet because soon we'll do a salt technique, so I need to keep that area wet until I drop the salt in. Now I'm coming in with a favorite new color, which is indigo blue. It's a beautiful, rich, dark blue color. Mine's made by Daniel Smith. I have loved blue paint for years. I used to be an acrylic painter, um, but I've been painting watercolor for quite a few years now. And I kind of can't believe I waited so long to buy this color. I absolutely adore the indigo. It's so um, rich and dark. Um, here what I'm doing is I'm going into the areas of wet paint and I'm dragging my pencil, just my uh, fine tip H pencil, and I find that, that um, dragging it through the paint creates these little lines that are finer than what I could get with my paint brushes. Um, so I drag it through and it kind of etches some cool lines through the paint as well as draws out some lines. Now I'm coming through with my watercolor pencil crayons and same thing, I'm dragging them through the wet paint this one is a green one, I believe it's olive green, and so I often wet down my watercolor pencil crayon first by dipping it in my water. You'll notice that um, I drag it through the wet areas just like I did with the regular pencil. And I have a little scratch pad of, um, of watercolor paper down to the right where I'll tap my pencil crayon on. So if I dip it in the water and it's got a big blob of water on it, I'll just tap it on that little piece of um, scrap paper. It's kind of fun to draw these loose lines. You'll notice that I also hold my pencil more towards the end, and that's to try to keep a loose flowing um, stroke to my hand. Uh, if you grip it tight like you're, you would when you're writing words, um, it tends to get, well, we get more uptight. So I try to hold uh, the pencil or the paintbrush in a looser way to give my, just my hand a break and give a bit more freedom to the strokes. So I just did a little brush stroke there, a wet brush stroke to pull some of that indigo out. Um, so I'm getting a little bit of a bleed by using a wet brush stroke. It's allowing that color to flow into that area. And coming in with a few more um, strokes to the right hand side, just sort of gently building up these layers. It's almost like we're creating a wreath or a nest. This is a dry flat brush, so no water on it. And what I'm doing is I'm curving it to drag it through some of the wet paint. And the lines are quite subtle, but I just wanted to soften that area and I wanted to do it in a kind of interesting way. And now I'm using the same dry brush to kind of pull through the wet paint on the left and flick it up to the top. So it's a way to lift a little bit of paint as well as make some strokes. So here I am sprinkling in some salt. It's just regular table salt, um, although you could also try a big rock salt. And I aim for the areas that are the big wet puddles. That's where the salt technique will show the most. Now I'm going to add in more layers of wet paint here and continue to build. As you build, just pay attention to where you have put the salt so that you don't paint on top of the salted areas. They take quite a long time to dry um, because that's where you have big puddles of paint, um, but we can work in other areas of the composition and move around the outside.
So this area of the painting is still wet, which is allowing me to put in a bit more color and it's just going to blend into the layers below. I've switched to a smaller fine tip brush. I think it's a number four or a number six to add in more of this green color. And once again, going in with the pencil crayons to drag through those areas of paint, trying to be a little bit braver to get a few bold strokes. I tried first with the watercolor pencil crayon and now I'm dragging it out a little bit more with just the H pencil. And when you drag it through the wet areas um, at the bottom, it can also make these little etch lines that etch into the page and catch a little bit of paint in them. It's very subtle texture, but it adds a nice um, soft effect to it. As I look at this area on the left, I'm assessing it and deciding I'd like a little bit more grounding to it, a little bit darker color, so I put in a bit more of that Payne's Gray color, and I'm going in with a little more of the salt technique. Now I'm starting to dot in a little bit of a pattern, uh, just little taps of the watercolor pencil crayon. If you don't have a watercolor pencil crayon, you could just use a really fine tip um, pen, um, paintbrush, excuse me. I'm just doing a little bit of a repeat pattern. It makes me think about things that are flowing in the tide, um, little plants or little tiny microorganisms. I just like to add a little layer of texture. So I did some in olive green, and this is a beautiful bright blue color called Kingfisher Blue. And I'm adding a few more in. I try to add, overlap a couple of the areas. So I'm starting in that lower blue area and going up into the lighter blue area with the pencil crayon. And it, by repeating the pattern, it kind of links the areas um, of the composition together. So you can let it dry naturally um, because you can let it dry while we're going on to the next painting stage with the Orca, or you can dry it with a hair dryer or a heat gun. I'm going to remove it at this stage from the watercolor block because I need um, the next piece of paper for the Orca. So I'm just using a little bone folder here. It's a bookmaking tool. You could also use um, a dull butter knife to remove your page from the block. Just go slow and gently. Um, it's really sad to rip it at this stage, which has happened to me before. So go slow and peel it off. And once I get it peeled off, I also check the back side because it's usually damp still. And then you can let that air dry or you can give it a little blast of heat. Sometimes uh, heating it from the back can help uh, keep it from buckling. So there we have our background and we can put it to the side to dry and we'll go on to the next stage. Now we're ready to paint our beautiful, strong, graceful orca. So this is the template that's included in the lesson plan and you can print it out on your computer printer. And like I said um, in the supplies part, I just use um, a pencil. A f this one's a 4B, a nice soft pencil to go around the back of the page. Uh, you could just color cover the whole page or you'll see me flipping the page and I'm um, following the lines where I know I'll be tracing. Um, if you want, you could use a, a sort of tracing paper medium, but I just find this a super simple um, method. So I'm going to position it at the top of my watercolor page um, and tape it down in place. You could use washi tape or masking tape. And if I put it at the top of the piece of paper, um, then we'll be able to do the starfish at the bottom piece of the paper. So um, I'm always economical with my supplies. I like to get the most out of each sheet of beautiful watercolor paper. So taping it down makes it so that it won't slide on us. And now I'm just using an H pencil um, to trace over the lines carefully. You want to push hard enough that you can see them so you can pull up the page and check the back as you work. Just take a little peek and see if you'll be able to see it. Um, but you don't want to press so hard that you're engraving or etching the page with a really deep line. Um, a little bit of a line will be okay because eventually after we paint this, we're going to be cutting it out.
Okay, now that I've removed the template, I'm just going to clean up some of the lines uh, just to make sure that I can see them when I'm painting. So going over it with the H pencil and just dotting in a few more of those areas. And uh, if you have any areas that you'd like to fix that didn't trace nicely or you'd like to adjust the shape slightly, you can do it now. And then I give it a light erase so that I uh, won't be able to see it afterwards. Here I was playing around with a few different blue colors because I thought possibly about doing the Orca with some blue mixed in. But then I decide ultimately that I am going to use the Yarka Black. So as I mentioned, the black that I'm using is from a Russian set called Yarka. It's just a straightforward black color. Um, I'm going to mix, lather it up and mix some of it into part of the palette. Um, a similar color, um, you could use an ivory black or um, Daniel Smith. Smith makes a McCracken black. And then we're ready to start our beautiful Orca. So that first stroke, especially being black, can feel a little bit scary because it's so strong a color. Um, so I take a deep breath just as if I'm doing yoga and then I actually do a stroke, um, the first stroke on an exhale. And um, I felt a little bit nervous about messing up my Orca. Whenever we do something more realistic, it can feel a little intimidating. Um, but I decided to just be brave and the key to having a gorgeous color is to add enough water to it to get the paint activated but not so much water that it will turn it to a light gray. Now I'm carefully painting around the white area, which is the false eye. The eye will put in later using a white pen and it's very tiny right in front of that patch. That patch is actually just to distract predators, um, make them think that that's the eye if they were attacking, but the eye is in fact in front of the white patch. So you'll notice that I often uh, turn my paper while I'm working. That's one of the nice parts of working on a watercolor block is you have the ability to move it. If you've used watercolor paper where you taped it down to something, I, I always recommend taping it to a board that you could also turn. I just find the easiest way to get into the, the corners of uh, an image that I'm painting or um, just to have a better angle with my brush that it's easiest for me to turn the page.
So the next part that we need to work on with the orca is the belly and saddle areas. So in the first part of the painting, I just left those areas white, but I actually want to create a gray blend. So I'm just going to show you here that when you have a dry area of the black, if you use a damp brush, especially one that's a bit coarse, you can have the color pull out of the black into the white area to make a gray. So I've dampened my brush, but then I wipe it on um, the rag and I was just fixing it there so it came back to a point. And now I'm going into this white area. So there's no color on my brush, just water. And I'm gently scrubbing, although scrubbing is kind of too strong a word. I'm going very gently with uh, the wet brush to pull some of the black color into the white area like a bleed. Now you really want to make sure you don't have a lot of water on the brush, which is why I tap it onto the rag. Because if you have too much water, the water is going to push uh, lines, um, like a run into the black area. And you want the black to be pulling into the white, not the water pushing into the black area. So I'm just going along gently, kind of rubbing it with the tip of my brush. And you'll see that the black starts to pull into the white area. I do this part kind of tentatively until I've decided what I want these patches to look like. These patches on the orca are distinctive patches. Um, they are often what scientists would use to identify the different whales, uh, as well as the shape of their dorsal fin. So you could use a bit of a gray paint if you wanted to, but I thought that just using the black that's already there and pulling it into the white area would be the easiest way. And these patches on the orca, um, they kind of vary in their shape and their, their texture, how dark the gray is. So it's okay if it's not an even tone of gray. Um, it can kind of look, if you look at some photographs online at orcas, it can kind of look um, like, like there's a swirl of gray that goes into the black. I also use a rag to lift some of the area of paint. Once it's damp, you can lift it and see if that look works for you. Here I decide to add in a little bit of black paint as well to encourage some of that uh, look of the paint bleeding into the white area. I just encourage you to go slowly and gently while you try to figure out this blend. So after going quite slowly and gently trying to get that blend the way I wanted it to be, I actually decide that I want my orca's patch to be a darker gray. So I've mixed up a little bit of the black onto the scrap paper at the top of my desk and I've added some water to it. And still working pretty tentatively, I'm going in with a light coat of gray. And sometimes that's what happens when we paint. We think we have an idea of how we want to accomplish something. And then as we're going along, we shift gears and decide to try a different approach. So I've gone in with gray, which is just the watered down Yarka black. And then I'm going to continue to layer in the gray as well as blend it into the uh, black areas around that patch.
Here's a closer look at her. So you can see on the belly area here, I've just done a really light gray and then a bit of a darker gray at the top blended into the black. And the area around the mouth and the eye patch are just completely white. I didn't add anything to them. Now it's time to work on our starfish. So I'm looking over my dry composition, my background, and trying to assess the scale I want the starfish to be. And I noticed that my washi tape circle is, which is about one, one and a half inches, um, would be a good scale for the starfish. Of course, the scale of the starfish isn't really in relation to the orca. Um, they're much bigger than they, they would be um, in real life um, compared to the orca. But this is art and this is our composition, so we get to decide how we dream things up. Um, I've decided on this size and I'm going to use these circles as little tracers to practice in my sketchbook. So this is just regular drawing paper. I've used both the outside of the tape circle and the inside. So for the starfish, I'm going along and making five marks because these starfish have five arms. They don't have to be perfectly evenly spaced because the starfish, um, they curve and they bend their arms as they cling to the rocks or, or reach as they move. So I'm trying, the first method is making these arcing motions, um, sketching in these curved lines. Um, why, the reason why I'm doing this is that I want to try to get that feeling of uh, curving in the arms. So this gives me the underpinnings for the starfish and then I'm going to go around and draw in the arms. And this is just for some practice. So the tips are a little bit pointed but a little bit round as well. The arms get skinnier towards the end and then there's sort of a curve between each of the five arms. The arms can reach out beyond the edge of the circle as well. I just found that the circle gave this guideline that um, gets me started with having the right number of arms and sort of the right placement where the arms are sort of the equal length. My next circle is a little bit larger. Again, I'm going to sketch in the five marks. And this time I'm just going right into drawing the starfish. On this arm, I'm curving the tip of the arm up. I thought that would give it a nicer character. For the third star here, I'm using the same method. Uh, this time I'm going to work on some arms that curve in a different way. They'll curve down instead of up. Remember that these stars are representative of your healing journey. Um, they are representative of your future and where you're going. So you can give them the character that feels right to you. If you want to make them a little heavier and stronger looking, that works. If you want to make them uh, thinner and lighter, um, and more graceful that works as well it's your piece and the character you give them should represent your journey and 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 the feeling that you want to have in your journey so play around with a few versions of these i find sometimes some of the arms just look a little wonky and i need to re-sketch them it's interesting how some work out so beautifully and others are a little crooked and odd i just tends to be one of those things that I need to um, 
to practice and you may need to as well but you might uh, strike upon one that you really love and then you could reproduce that shape or you could do all different types of stars Next up, I'm just going to go over my final shape with a permanent marker. This is a 0.5 pen. It's a Stedler Micron pen. And this just gives me um, the outer shape instead of having all those pencil markings in the way. And just like we did with the whale, I'm going to use these as little tracers onto my watercolor paper. So I use that 4B pencil, nice soft pencil to rub on the background, and I'm going to transfer a few of them to my watercolor paper. After I've traced a few that I like, I'm also just going to freehand a couple more. You can choose however many stars you want to do. I recommend having a few extras in case you um, have a little oops during the painting stage or the cutting stage. Um, when I was painting the background, I talked to you about how it's a bit like a wreath. Um, I learned a lot about floral design from my great auntie, who was a, a competitive floral arranger. And she always recommended working in odd numbers for floral design. So I've decided that I'd like to have um, enough starfish to play around with my design when I'm getting ready to glue them down, and that I would like enough that I can work with an odd number. Um, maybe I'll only use three, but I'd like to have extras. If I'm going to use three, um, I think that having five or six would be, um, be best. You don't have to use all of them in the end, but having extras is great to give you some options, and you can always use the extras in another journaling project if you wish. Since I'm painting on the same page as the orca, I'm going to cover up the orca whale to make sure I don't accidentally splatter it. Um, you could cut the page first, but since I'm working on the block, I'm going to keep it there, but keep it covered just in case I have any splashes. I'm going to premix my colors for um, purple starfish first. I'm using alizarin red um, with cadmium yellow, uh, some ultramarine blue, and a little bit of cadmium red, which is my orangey color. So you can see I make my puddles first and then I pull the colors into each other trying to get to the color that I like. So I was thinking about kind of an orangey violet first and then I decided that I wanted to add a bit more um, blue into it, some ultramarine to make it darker. And I usually have my scrap watercolor paper nearby so I can test the colors before I commit to painting with them. It looks like I'm adding a little cerulean into that as well. So when you're painting your starfish, you're going to need a fairly fine-tipped paintbrush. Uh, you might want one that comes to a fine point, or you might one, want a brush that is a little bit rounder at the tip. It just depends on the type of control you like to have. So I started with that one, which is really pointy. And then I switched to another brush that's a little rounder, because the point was actually flicking out uh, little marks outside of the lines that I didn't want. So for painting the starfish, I'm just going to use a wet onto dry technique. This will take a little bit of time doing the starfish because they're quite tiny, so you need your good brush control. Put some nice music on, maybe have a cup of tea, and just relax into your painting.
For the orange starfish, I want a really nice bright color. So I'm going to use cadmium red, which is like my orange, and add a little bit of cadmium yellow to it to brighten it. And I think these orange starfish are going to look really lovely against our background because our black background is bluey green and the orange is a complementary color to blue. So these ones are really going to pop against our background. So I'm not going to dull down that orange color too much. I'm just going to keep it nice and vibrant. The next step is to choose a pen that you want to use to draw on the spines. So I have Sakura Jelly Roll pens as well as the Uniball Signo pen. So I'm going to start with the Uniball Signo. I quite like the pen because I like how opaque the white is. And I'm just practicing on my scratch paper to get a nice dot going. Sometimes the tips get clogged. Um, I'm trying the Jelly Roll one out as well. 
Um, so we're going to do a dot pattern for the spines of the starfish. Now they do follow a certain pattern where little lines of dots reach and wrap around the arms and down the arms. But what I like about this pattern is that you don't have to follow it exactly. So you can have large dots and tiny dots. And as long as you sprinkle them all around the starfish, um, maybe with one or two larger dots every now and again, you're going to have the feeling of a starfish. Um, it doesn't have to be a perfect pattern. Now doing all these dots is going to take some time and I find when I do something repetitive and I know it's going to take a bit of time, at the beginning I almost start to rush or get frustrated by it. But this time I was thinking about how if I just kind of take a deep breath and slow myself down to, that I can make the process of doing this repeat pattern just a more meditative experience. Um, we can just kind of let our mind drift um, and just focus on those dots. You can give your hand a little shake, a little break uh, during this process. But if you're feeling frustrated by it um, because it does take some time, take a few deep breaths or walk away from it for a minute and come back to it. Um, I think that doing something repetitive can, if we work on it, we can find something uh, calming in the experience. My white uniball pen was starting to get a bit clogged and make C shapes instead of making nice dots. So I decided to just switch it up and use the Sakura Jelly Roll pen instead. It's a number five and you can get a few different variations in the size of the dot, uh, just depending on how hard you press or just circling around to make bigger dots. Here we have our beautiful orca and starfish. I'm going to remove them from the watercolor block and then start the process of cutting them out. I've decided to use scissors to cut out um, the orca and the starfish. You might want to use an X-Acto blade instead on a self-healing mat. It's really whatever you're comfortable with. I just find being able to hold the paper in one hand and move the scissors in the other hand is the easiest way for me to get around the curves. But really whatever works best for you. You're going to be cutting right up to the edge of the orca, so you're going right up to the paint. You don't want to leave any white trim around the edges. So just again, like I say in lots of my painting and projects, take a deep breath, uh, go slow, and work your way around the whale.
you'll see that I had a few little tricky spots there uh, near the tail and also on the head of the orca. So I'm just going to go in with my X-Acto blade to clean up a few areas. And later you'll have the opportunity to add a little bit of paint into any of those areas if you still feel like you can't get the white parts out. Now it's time to cut out the starfish and I think the easiest way is to loosely cut out each of them first. That kind of gives you the dexterity to be able to um, turn each of them as you go. Now that I have all of my elements done, I'm able to focus on the composition. So I have my background, my orca, and my starfish all ready to go. I've decided since the beginning that I would have the orca near the top of the circle, but this gives me a chance now to play with exactly where it fits. So I'm thinking about the lines like the seaweed green lines in the background and the waves, and I'm thinking about areas that I don't want to have covered up by the whale. Um, I'm thinking with the starfish about where I have uh, color contrast, so the blue background with the orange looks really nice. And I'm thinking about little groupings. How can I snug these starfish in next to each other? So look at your background and play around with a few different ideas. One trick I use is um, to make a little composition, snap a picture with my iPhone, and then rearrange it a different way. But then I can remember um, which composition I liked best. So have a little bit of fun playing around with here and try out a few different options. In the next part of the video, I actually had a bit of a difficulty with the video where uh, the frames were frozen. So I've picked out a few still images from the video to tell you what I was working on. Um, what I use is a pencil to mark the placement of my orca. So here you can see me making a few dots just so I can uh, have a placement before I get ready to glue it. And then I also noticed that the tail of my orca had a little bit of a white mark on it, like I mentioned earlier. So I used some black paint to just touch up that one little area that was a bit fuzzy. I like to use heavy gel matte medium to glue down my pieces. Um, that part of the video was um, stalled out too, so I'll just show you in my sketchbook that I use an acrylic brush to paint on the matte medium and I usually like this one because it's so nice and thick. And as I'm brushing it on, I often um, check the corners and the other sides for extra that oozes through, and then I just wipe it off with my finger. And when I place it down, I often use a piece of scrap paper just to rub it on, and that grabs any extra glue as well as uh, keeps me from smearing the original painting. That's how I adhere my collage elements.
And here's what my composition is looking like glued down. I went with three little stars at the bottom and one at the top. I'm using my watercolor pencil crayon, a blue one, um, just dry this time. Uh, you don't have to add water to them, so I'm just using it like a little marker to add a few more uh, dots and details in. You could alternatively use a Neocolor crayon or a regular pencil crayon or even um, a Posca paint pen or jelly roll pen. Lots of options here. And I'm twirling through, uh, you'll notice I spin my pencil crayon to twirl it. I'm just adding a few more green lines in like seaweed. And I've decided to add a few dots and markings in with a blue Posca pen. This is a light blue pen with a fine tip. So I'm just dotting in a few little patterns like bubbles in the sea. This bright blue is uh, nice against the dark background. So I'm just touching in a few here and a few there. And next I come in with a gold jelly roll pen to add in a few more details. I just like having a little bit of sparkle in my pieces, especially for something that's underwater. I sat for quite a long time contemplating what word or words or phrases I wanted to include in this piece. And as I thought about the journey of the orcas in this area, as well as my own journey, the word that I decided on was strength, which is one of the words from our theme. You can choose a single word to weave into your piece, or you can choose phrases or several words to weave around the outside of the circle. If you want more room to write and reflect, you could have the words go in a circular way around the entire composition, around the outside, or you could use the bottom of the page to write a whole paragraph if you wish. Um, just because I've done one word doesn't mean you need to only have one word. Um, I want this to be a special piece for you and to represent your own journey. So whatever way you feel the words fit in, um, please choose that one. I've gone with the same blue pen that I wrote the word in and I'm carefully going around my piece now to do these lines. Um, they are sort of representative of waves and also they reflect um, the nautical charts that I, I grew up with. Um, there's lines in the charts that show the different depths of the water. So it's a symbol that I often include in my various um, artworks. I'm really pleased with how this piece has pulled together. I think that it has a calm and peaceful feeling to it, but it also is strong and vibrant, and I like those two elements together. I hope that you've really enjoyed the process and that it is part of your healing journey um, and that you've learned a little bit about my area of the world. There's a few more details that you can add in paint pen if you like. And the very final step with this one is to add a little white dot for the eye.
Thank you so much for joining me for this lesson. I wish you courage, strength, and healing in your art making. I really look forward to connecting with you in the classroom or the Facebook community. You can find me at NicoleWarrington.com or at CoastalNicole on Instagram. I can't wait to see what you create.